Jason Chandler sat on the couch looking at his phone. Not long ago, he received a disturbing call from Karen, his wife of nearly 10 years. Earlier that day, she told him she and her lover had just boarded a flight to Honolulu. He knew they planned to spend the week there, even though she told him something different. It was just the latest in a long line of lies and bad decisions on her part. He wondered to himself how he could have been so stupid and blind. For nearly ten years, he had given everything to build a life with Karen. But that was all gone now. He took another sip of his coffee and sat back in his chair, closing his eyes. He thought about the last decade. He met Karen in college thirteen years ago. They were both working for a business degree and were part of the same study group. That led to them dating. Eventually, they fell in love and married after graduation. He went to work for his father, who owned a chain of successful tire stores across the state. He had always worked for his dad, spending his summers in one of the many stores his father owned. Sometimes, he worked in the shop, replacing tires and brakes. Sometimes, he worked as a runner, driving tires and parts to some of the local shops. As a result, he learned a lot about the business. After college, his father talked him into working for him at the corporate headquarters in the accounting department. Over the years, Jason proved himself to be more than capable of handling whatever needed to be done and was now in charge of the accounting department, working directly for Mike Allen, the CFO, who was set to retire in a couple of years. Jason knew that it was his father's dream to hand the company over to him when he retired and he knew that when Mike retired, he would be promoted to take over his position. Karen, meanwhile, had taken a job as a realtor. After they married, she went to school and got her license to sell real estate. She was darn good at her job and made pretty good money, even during leaner years when the market wasn't doing very well. They had a good life, or so he thought. They scrimped and saved and were able to buy a nice house in the suburbs. They each drove a nice fairly new car and to all outside appearances had a secure marriage. They didn't have any children, something which bothered him more than her. Right now, he thought that was something of a blessing in disguise. Early on, Karen said there was something wrong with her tubes, so she had them tied. He consoled her and suggested they look into adoption, but Karen dismissed the idea. Eventually, he accepted the notion that they would never have any children. But several things happened over the last year that made him think something was going on. Something that would forever change his relationship with Karen. For starters, Karen began spending more time with the girls than ever before. He never begrudged her some time out as he knew how stressful her job was. But the every two-week happy hour that only lasted until 7 p.m. became a two- or three-night-a-week event. And depending on the day of the week, she might not get home until midnight or later. Jason wasn't happy about it and expressed his displeasure, but she waved him off, saying she was under a lot of stress at work and deserved time to blow off some steam. So what are you doing until midnight? He asked her one night when she got home, her hair disheveled, and her clothes smelling like cigarette smoke. Oh, had a few drinks. Sometimes we might dance if the mood hits us. Look, Jace, it's none of your concern. I'm a big girl and I don't need you telling me what to do. So lay off, okay? Jason looked at her, shocked. She had never spoken to him like this before. She saw the look on his face and softened up. I'm sorry, Jace. I didn't mean to go off on you. It's just that we're under a lot of pressure with the market the way it is. You've worked through tough times in the market before, and it didn't bother you. What's different about this time? You have no idea how hard it is sometimes. The competition is getting worse and worse, and the higher-ups are putting more pressure on us to sell property. I understand that, dear, he told her. But you don't need to take it out on me. I'm on your side, remember? She smiled and wrapped her arms around him. You're right, dear. Please accept my apology. All right, I accept, but please take a shower or something. No offense but you smell like an ashtray. Sorry, there were a lot of people smoking at the club. I'll go take a shower. He laid down 
and was asleep by the time she made it to bed. The next few months saw other changes as well. The frequency of their sex dropped dramatically. Before this started, they used to make love three or four times a week. That dropped to twice a week and eventually fell off to about once every two weeks, if he was lucky. Even worse, her attitude toward him seemed to change. Before, she always asked about his work and took interest in his hobbies. Now, it seemed that she could care less what he had to say. Then there was the day he caught her in a blatant lie. One day, he decided to drop by her office to take her out to lunch. When he got there, however, he was told she was out showing some property. That night after Karen got home from whatever it was she was doing with the girls, he asked about her day. I was in the office all day today. I had a lot of paperwork to catch up on, so I just grabbed a sandwich out of the vending machine. Jason was shocked. She just lied to him with a straight face. As far as he knew, this was the first time she had ever done that. He thought about pressing her on it, but chose not to. In her frame of mind, she would probably blow a gasket, and he was simply too tired to deal with that. He began to wonder, though, how many other times she had lied to him. Later that night, as they lay in bed, he rolled over and looked at her. She saw the concern on his face. What's wrong, Jace? she asked. I'm concerned, he said. About what? Us. I feel like we're drifting apart from each other. Do you still love me? Of course I do, honey, she said, putting an arm around him. You know that, don't you? Honestly, I don't know. I can't remember the last time you told me. And it's been a while since we've had sex. It seems you're gone more than your home. I'm sorry. It's just the pressure from the job. I do love you. Please believe me. Can you start showing me a little more? He asked. Of course, baby, she said, kissing his face. They made love that night, and Jason felt better, but he still had concerns. Things went back to normal for a month or so, but the same pattern began to emerge again. What the hell is going on? He asked himself for the umpteenth time. It started to become clear to him what was going on the day his longtime friend, Ron Green, called him, asking if he could get away for a bit. Sure. I can meet you for a beer. What's going on? I really can't say over the phone, Jace, but it's important. Okay, I'll meet you there at 5.30 if that works. They ended the call and Jason met Ron at the bar that evening. Jason wasn't too worried about being late, as Karen was almost always gone until 6 or 7 p.m., sometimes later. Okay, bud, Jason said as they sipped their beer. Spill it. What's going on? Jace, I saw your wife today while I was out doing my runs. Yeah, she sells real estate, probably out showing some property. I'm sure, but I never knew selling real estate involved kissing and handholding. What? Come on, you're pulling my leg. I wish I was, buddy. I was going down Riverside Drive, and I saw your wife coming out of a house with some man. They were holding hands and then they kissed. I'm not talking about a smack on the cheek, either. He had his hands all over her hips at the same time. That can't be. Are you sure you're talking about my Karen? Ron pulled out his cell phone and showed Jason a picture. Sure enough, it was Karen, kissing a man who had his hands all over her backside. Darn, Jason said quietly as he handed the phone back. Can you email me that picture? Sure. Ron said, hitting some buttons on his phone. So, what are you going to do? Jason shook his head. I don't know, buddy. Things have been off for a while now, but I would never have thought she'd do something like this. A friend of mine is a private investigator. If you want, I can put you in touch with him. Do that. I need to know what the hell is going on. They said their goodbyes and headed out the door. Karen was in the kitchen when he got home. This was something new, he thought to himself. You're home early, he said, giving her a kiss. I'm not complaining. By the way, she smiled and kissed him back. Where were you? she asked. 
I was down having a beer with Ron. I wasn't expecting you home so early. So I figured, what the heck? Everything okay with your friend? She asked. Not really. He just learned that the wife of a friend of his is running around on her husband. Oh. Yeah. He saw her kissing and holding hands with some guy earlier today. Jason thought he saw her flinch just a bit. Well, maybe he's reading too much into it. I don't know. I'm just glad I don't have that problem. Again, he thought she seemed to flinch just a bit at that remark. It would kill me if you ever did anything like that to me. I'd never do anything like that to you, she said, wrapping her arms around him. I love you too much. I'm glad to hear you say that, he told her, kissing her pretty face. So, why are you home so early? Well, our annual company convention is coming up this weekend. So I thought I'd start packing, and I wanted to spend the next night or two with you since we'll be apart for a few days, she said. It's in Las Vegas this year. Where at? he asked. Over at the convention center. We're all staying at the Westgate Resort. I hear it's a four-star hotel. So, when are you leaving? he asked. Friday afternoon. Right after lunch, she said. That was the day after tomorrow. You getting another award this year? he asked. She always received awards for being the top seller in the region. Probably, she said. They shared another kiss. Well then, why don't I take you upstairs and congratulate you for another successful year? She smiled and took him by the hand. I thought you'd never ask, she said. They spent the evening making love, but Jason had other things on his mind. Would she cheat on him over the weekend? He asked himself. Say, I have some vacation time coming up. Why don't I take a few days and come with you? Maybe we can spend the week in Vegas and unwind a bit and reconnect. Our 10th anniversary is coming up next week, you know. That sounds like fun, but I'll be so busy with seminars and meetings, I don't think we'd hardly ever see each other. Besides, they're expecting me to get right back to work after the convention. Listen, why don't we celebrate our anniversary when I get back? I'll make it up to you, I promise. Okay, I'm going to hold you to that. The next day, he contacted Ron and got the name and number of the private investigator. He arranged a meeting for that day and drove over before lunch. Good morning, Mr. Chandler, the middle-aged man said as Jason entered his cluttered office. Good to meet you. Ron said you might be calling. Please call me Jerry. What can I do for you? Jason explained the situation and told him about Karen's upcoming trip to Las Vegas. Vegas, huh? You think she intends to hook up with someone at the convention? I don't know. It's possible. Well, I have contacts out there who owe me a favor or two. Tell you what, we'll put eyes on her there and if you want, we can sneak in a camera and a microphone if you get me her room number. It'll cost extra, you know. I figured that, but I need to know the truth. Jerry pulled out a digital audio recorder and handed it to him. This is really simple to use. It's voice activated, so all you have to do is slip it under her car seat and turn it on. You can retrieve it later after she's left. I'm assuming she'll be leaving her car at the airport. She usually does, Jason said. Good, don't worry. We've got it all covered. If she is messing around, we'll find out. By the way, here's my private number in case you hear anything. Call me anytime. Thanks, Jason said, writing a check from his personal account instead of the joint account. Both he and Karen had their own personal accounts, separate from the joint checking account, which was used to pay the bills. They had each agreed on this years ago, promising to deposit no more than 10% of their net earnings. Until now, Jason had used his for clothes, incidentals, and presents for Karen. He had been saving for a cruise but was now using it for something else. That night, Karen finished packing for her trip. Jason offered to carry her bags to the car, an offer she gladly accepted. That would be such a big help, she said, giving him a kiss. He carried the bags to her car, placing them in the trunk. 
He couldn't help but notice how much she packed. It was certainly more than enough for a weekend. As he put her overnight bag in the trunk, he couldn't resist the urge to see what she had taken, so he opened the case. He spotted the container holding her birth control pills right off the bat. Only ten were left in the container. What the heck? He asked himself. Why does she have birth control pills? Didn't she say she had her tubes tied? Or was that another lie? He glanced at the clothes she packed. Some of what she packed seemed appropriate for a business meeting, but much of it appeared to be club wear, tiny dresses he had never seen before and frilly underwear. He also noticed a couple of very skimpy bikinis, one of which appeared to be an open sling micro bikini, something he had only seen on the internet. What the heck kind of meeting is this? He asked himself. He pulled out his phone and took pictures. Opening her car door, he slipped the audio recorder under her seat and made sure it was turned on. Then he closed the car doors and made sure everything was locked up. They made love that night, perhaps, Jason thought, for the last time as husband and wife. Karen gave him her room number the next morning at breakfast and promised to call every night. I love you, she told him as she kissed him on the cheek. I love you too. He watched as she pulled out and drove off. When he got to work, he called Jerry and gave him her room number. Great, thanks. I'll get my guys on it right away. That afternoon, he got a call from Karen, letting him know she was at the airport and getting ready to take off. I'll call you when I get checked into my room, she said. I'd appreciate that. Remember, I love you. I love you too, baby. I'll miss you. Sure you will, you lying witch, he thought to himself sarcastically. I miss you too, he said instead. As he ended the call, he looked up to see his father standing in the door. Everything okay, son. You look like your dog just died. I don't know, Dad. His father came into the office and closed the door. Everything okay at home? You want to talk about it? His father asked. Jason knew better than to try to keep anything from his father, so he told him everything he knew so far. That doesn't sound too good, son. I never would have suspected her of cheating on you. Me neither, Dad, Jason said. Well, listen, if there's anything your mom or I can do, let me know, the older man said. We're here for you. Thanks, Dad. I appreciate that. Jason took off a couple of hours early and drove to the airport looking for Karen's car. He found it in the short-term parking and retrieved the audio recorder. Looking around, he noticed the rest of the car was neat as a pin. On the way home, he got a call from Karen. Hi, baby. Just wanted to let you know I got here okay. Thanks for letting me know, he said. I'm just getting settled in. I'll call you later tonight. Love you. Love you too, he said. After he got home, he turned on the audio recorder. He hoped there would be nothing on it, and for the most part, there wasn't anything except road noise and the sound of her radio. About halfway through the recording, however, he heard his marriage go down the toilet. He could hear her phone ringing, and since it was connected to her car through Bluetooth and worked through her speakers, he could hear both sides of the conversation. Hey baby, he heard a man's voice say. Hey yourself, Stud Muffin, she said. Stud Muffin, Jason asked himself. Who the heck is this clown? I can't wait to see you again. Last week was fantastic. I'm glad you approve, she said with a naughty giggle. Are we set for next week? Next week? Jason asked himself, shocked. Got it all taken care of. Did you tell your husband? Not yet. Don't worry, sweetie. I've got it all under control. He doesn't suspect anything, does he? The man asked. Not a thing. He's clueless as ever. I hope you're right, he said. I told you, don't worry. He'll believe whatever I tell him. Good, the man said. Listen, I'm about ready to pull into the airport. I'll see you at the hotel tonight, okay? I can't wait. Bye. Lover. Bye-bye, she said, ending the call. Jason stared at the recorder, 
not believing what he had just heard. He played it again, just to make sure he wasn't taking anything out of context. Not only was she cheating on him, but she had something planned for next week, the week of their tenth anniversary, and it didn't include him. Darn, 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 he thought to himself. How long has this crap been going on? And who the heck was this pig she was screwing? He grabbed a beer from the refrigerator and sat at his desk, thinking over the last few months. Had he really been so clueless that he missed all the signs? He started wondering what else she might be hiding. Up until now he had always respected her privacy and stayed out of her personal things, but that was now off the table. He knew she kept her home desk locked, but he also knew where she kept the key. He went to their bedroom and opened a small drawer in her jewelry box. Sure enough, there was the key to her desk, on a ring with a couple of other keys. He grabbed the ring and went into the bedroom they set up as her office. He opened the desk and started looking through her files. Ordinarily, he would never have done this. But he felt that she no longer deserved any consideration after her betrayal of their marriage vows. What he found shocked him to the core. It seemed that Karen had been lying to him throughout their entire marriage. He pulled out a folder she used for her banking records and was shocked to see how much she had socked away out of her pay. He knew how much she deposited in their joint account and was shocked to see that she had deposited much more than the agreed-upon 10% into her private account, which now had over $250,000. Looking through her purchases over the last few months, he saw that she had purchased a very expensive man's Rolex watch along with other gifts, no doubt for her lover, since she had never given him anything that extravagant. She had also purchased a lot of expensive clothing online including some racy stuff from Victoria's Secret. Of course, he hadn't seen any of this, but there was more, much more. He also found medical bills for a family planning clinic. Apparently, she was able to get pregnant, twice in the last two years, and had gone in for an abortion. Both times, she paid cash out of her own account. He wondered if one or both of the children she aborted was really his. He also saw that she had been paying for birth control pills for at least the last four years on a regular basis. Worse yet, he found a receipt for Plan B morning after pills. According to the date on the receipt, Karen had purchased them earlier this week. And there was more. Among her receipts was a fairly recent one for a hefty down payment on a condo in a fairly wealthy part of town. Was this to be her love nest? He wondered. Or was this part of her exit strategy from the marriage? There were also receipts for utilities and new furniture. He looked at the key ring he found earlier and wondered if one of them was a key to her condo. He intended to find out. He turned on her computer to see what he could glean from that. He knew she always wrote her passwords down and found a piece of paper taped to the bottom of her keyboard with a list of usernames and passwords written on it. He tried the first one and sure enough, the computer came right up. Opening her browser, he found a link to an online email program and went in. Sure enough, the email client came right up and showed her inbox. Apparently, she was so confident he would never snoop on her that she kept the username and password cached on the system. He began scanning her emails and was shocked at what he found. There were a number of emails, too, and from someone named Greg Wilson. Almost all of the emails were explicit, with Greg commenting on how much he loved having sex with Karen. Her responses were pretty much the same. He noticed the emails went back almost an entire year, about the time he first noticed the changes in her. From what he could tell, their trysts initially took place in hotel rooms, but they later decided to meet up at a house she was selling. He spotted an email dated about six months ago that partially answered one of his questions. Did you take care of that little problem? Greg asked. Yes, I went down and had the abortion today. Too bad you didn't keep it. You could have passed it off as Jason's. I couldn't do that. As far as he knows I can't have any children. He would know it wasn't his. Jason thought back six months and realized that was about the time he first caught her lying. The witch, he thought to himself. The lying, conniving cheating witch. He kept scanning through their emails. 
At one point, Greg suggested they have sex in Karen's marital bed, but she put her foot down on that. I will not do that to Jason, she told him in one email. Come on, the stupid cuck has no idea what's going on. No, she wrote back, I'm not going to do that. What if you had a place of your own? You could pay cash on a nice condo with the commissions you make and your husband would never know the difference. You may be onto something there. I do have my own account and Jason never asks about it. Let me see what's available. That was three months ago. The receipt for the down payment was dated just over a month ago. I got a condo, she told him in an email. I just made the down payment and I have new furniture coming in about a week. Jason doesn't know anything about it. Excellent. We'll have to christen every room in the place. Jason sat back, shocked at this revelation. He continued looking through the emails. So, why do you stay with your husband? Why not just leave him and move into the condo? Believe it or not, I still have feelings for him. He may be a stodgy accountant for a chain of tire stores, but I like him, and he's good to me. I only got the condo so we have a place to hook up without having to risk being seen at a hotel. Besides, you're still married. Listen, babe, say the word and I'll dump Christy in a heartbeat. She's a royal pain in the bum anyway. We'll see what happens after the conference, she wrote back. After the conference? What's happening after the conference? He asked himself. Jason began printing her emails and copying the receipts he found when the phone rang. Karen's number came up on the display. Hello, he said, answering the call. It's me, babe. Are you all right? You sound out of sorts. I've got a splitting headache, he said, not wanting to let her know he was onto her. Well, I just wanted to let you know I'm settling down for the night. You take something for that headache and get some rest. I love you and I miss you, she said. Yeah, me too, goodbye. He ended the call, wondering if she noticed that he didn't specifically say he loved her or missed her. Truth is, he was close to punching a hole in the wall. He decided to find out who this Greg character was, so he began looking on the website for the company Karen worked for. Sure enough, he found him. Greg Wilson. The site said, is the regional manager for the real estate company Karen works for. In other words, she was screwing her boss. He printed the page out and put it with his stack of stuff. Unable to rest, he decided to see if he could get into her condo. He verified the address but wondered if she had a security system set up. He looked through her paperwork and found a series of numbers on the paperwork next to the word alarm. Of course, she would write it down, he thought to himself. She writes everything down. He closed down her computer and headed out, stopping in the garage to grab a pair of latex gloves. He didn't want to leave any evidence that he had been there. He found the complex easily and parked in her allotted spot. Walking to the door, he put the gloves on and tried one of the keys on the ring he found in her jewelry box. Sure enough, the door opened and he walked in. He saw the alarm system console on the wall next to the door and entered the code he found in her paperwork, then verified the alarm was off. After turning on some lights, he looked around the condo and was impressed with Karen's choice of furnishings. She always had good taste, he thought. Too bad she wasn't as loyal as she was color-coordinated. Of course, there were no pictures that included him. He hadn't really expected any anyway. This was, after all, her love nest, her escape from their marriage. Walking into the kitchen, he noticed she even had a few dishes and some silverware. There wasn't much in the refrigerator, and the pantry seemed just as deserted. He was somewhat surprised to see the place was fully furnished, complete with tasteful portraits of flowers. There was even a large flat-screen television mounted to the wall. He walked into the master bedroom and noted that too was fully furnished, complete with long, lacy curtains over the windows that fell to the floor. She loved lacy curtains and had put them all over their house. Looking down, he couldn't help but notice they hung directly over an electric baseboard heater. He shook his head, wondering if Karen even considered the potential fire hazard. 
Opening the dresser drawers, he found some lingerie that he had never seen before along with men's underwear he suspected belonged to Greg. He also found an assortment of sex toys. He pulled out his phone and took pictures. He also found a card addressed to Karen in her nightstand drawer. He opened it and saw it was from Greg. Just wanted to say thanks for the watch. Can't wait for your housewarming. It was signed, Love, Greg. He felt like ripping Greg's arm off at the socket and beating his cheating wife with it. He found even more clothes, both men's and women's, on hangers inside the walk-in closet. Inside the master bathroom, he couldn't help but spot the two toothbrushes hanging over the sink and the his and hers towels on the rack next to the shower. He pulled out his phone and took more pictures. The second bedroom only contained a small desk and a chair. A network cable laid on the desk, suggesting she used that for her laptop. A few pieces of mail, addressed to her, lay on the table. All of them were from utility companies. He took a picture of those, making sure her name and address could be clearly read in the photos. The windows here were also covered with long, lacy curtains that fell to the floor. As in the master bedroom, they, too, fell right in front of an electric baseboard heater. Looking around, he noticed a few other things that could be considered fire or safety hazards. For example, there were no smoke detectors in the bedrooms, and the one mounted in the kitchen ceiling looked very old. He wondered if it even had a battery in it. Making sure everything was just as it was when he entered, he turned off all the lights, reactivated the security system, and left, making sure the door was locked. He went back to his car and headed home considering his options. Divorce was a no-brainer in his mind. Even if she got rid of the condo and called it quits with her lover, he could never trust her again. He also knew that men often got the short end of the stick, financially speaking. He knew from her financial records that she made considerably more than he did, so he hoped that would be enough to avoid alimony. He decided to wait until he spoke with an attorney before taking any action. He also hoped the fact that she already purchased a condo in her name only would mean he wouldn't have to give her the house or sell it and give her half the proceeds. In his mind, she abandoned him when she bought the condo without telling him. They didn't have any children, so child support and custody weren't an issue. But he wanted the two cheaters to pay for what they had done. Violence was out of the question as he had no desire to go to jail. After he got home, he looked in the phone book and found a listing for Gregory Wilson. He hoped it was the right Greg Wilson and dialed the number. Wilson residence, said a female voice. Is this Mrs. Wilson? He asked. Yes, it is. To whom am I speaking? My name is Jason Chandler. Is your husband the regional manager for Acme Real Estate? Jason asked. Yes, he is, but he's gone to a conference this weekend, and he'll be out next week visiting other offices. You'll have to call the regional office and leave a message for him there. Actually, Mrs. Wilson, you're the one I'd like to speak with, Jason said. Oh, she asked. Yes, ma'am. I hate to tell you this, but my wife is having an affair with your husband. Are you sure about this, she asked. Yes, I am and I can prove it. You have ironclad proof of this, she asked. I can even show you where they get together if you want. He could hear her sigh over the phone. Is tomorrow okay? She asked. Sure. What time works best for you? Make it about one o'clock in the afternoon, she said. He gave her the address and directions to Karen's condo. I'll see you there then, Jason told her, ending the call. Smiling. He went to his desk and began making a list of things to do. First thing, he decided, would be to change the locks on the doors. He could wrap that up in plenty of time to meet Greg's wife at Karen's condo. He considered getting drunk that night, but put the idea out of his head. Instead, he grabbed a piece of cold pizza and munched on that as he considered all of his options. Finishing the pizza, he trudged up the stairs to bed. He got up early the next day and headed to a local hardware store, where he bought everything he needed to change the door locks. He also made another key to the condo. By noon, 
he had all of them changed. He showered, and grabbing the audio recorder and all of the emails he printed from Karen's account, headed over to her condo to meet Greg's wife. He pulled into Karen's slot and spotted an attractive dark-haired woman in a Toyota Corolla not far away. He walked to the car and knocked on the window. She rolled the window down and looked at him. Are you Christy Wilson? he asked. She nodded her head. I am. You must be Jason Chandler. One and the same, he said, opening her door. Come with me. I'll show you their love nest. You may want to put these on first, though, he added, handing her a pair of latex gloves. I don't want to leave any fingerprints. Good idea, she said. They went to her door, and Jason used the key he had made to open it. He was glad to see it worked. After turning off the security alarm, they stepped inside. Jason showed her the bedroom, opening the drawers and the closet so she could see Greg's clothing. Oh my God, I've been looking for some of this stuff the past couple of weeks. I was wondering where his clothes were disappearing to. Has your husband been wearing a Rolex wash lately? Jason asked. She nodded her head. Yes, he told me it was a gift from management. Jason shook his head and pulled the card out of Karen's nightstand. He opened it up and showed it to her. She read the note and began crying. Is that his handwriting? Jason asked. Yes, she said, sobbing. There's more, he said, pulling out the emails and the audio recorder. She read through the emails, tears flowing down her cheeks. Then he played the audio from Friday. I'm sorry about all this, he said, wrapping his arms around her. He felt like crying as well, but held it in. It's not your fault. I suspected something like this for a while, but I never had any proof. After a while, she collected herself and looked at him. So, what are you going to do? she asked. I'm going to divorce her. What about you? I'm kicking that lame dog out of the house as soon as I see him, she said. Suddenly, she stopped crying and looked at him. I've got an idea, she said. What's that? he asked. They want to live here together. Why don't we help them? What do you mean? I mean, why don't we pack their crap up and drop it off over here? She responded. Jason thought for a bit and smiled at her. I kinda like that idea but we'd better get moving. They'll be back in a day or two. She shook her head. Greg said he would be gone for a week after the convention. I'd bet anything she'll find an excuse to be gone as well. Jason suddenly remembered the recorded conversation. Karen specifically asked him if he had everything set for the next week, but didn't indicate what it was they had planned. Darn, I think you're right. Still, I want to get her crap out of my house as soon as possible. I agree. Meet you back here in, say, three hours. Works for me. I'm just going to toss her crap in trash bags. So I think I can do that and be back here in three hours. I'll see you then, she said, standing up. Jason took a hard look at her. She was shorter than Karen, with a girl next door cuteness that added to her shapely figure. He thought Greg was a moron to cheat on this woman. They left the condo and arrived about three hours later, their cars crammed with bags full of their respective spouses' belongings. They carried the bags into the condo and tossed them into the nearly empty second bedroom, not caring if anything broke. They knew the two cheaters would have to spend hours sorting through everything. I don't know about you, but I wasn't exactly very careful with his things, she said. He laughed. Neither was I, Jason said. They laughed and did a high five. He looked at her. I don't know about you, but I'm hungry, he said. Me too. I could really go for a nice juicy hamburger. A big thick cheeseburger sounds really good to me as well. I know just the place. Care to join me? My treat. Lead on, she said. He drove to the bar he and Ron liked to visit, and she followed. After they parked, Christy looked at the front of the building. A bar, she asked. Trust me, they make the best burgers here. You'll love it. Okay, I just hope you're not going to ply me with alcohol. 
and take advantage of me. He laughed. As inviting as that sounds, I wouldn't do that to you, he said. Darn, she said, laughing. They went inside and ordered a beer and a burger with fries. As they ate, they swapped stories of their failing marriages. Her story was somewhat similar to his. She met him in college, and they married shortly thereafter, except she wanted children, and he didn't. He started working for Acma Real Estate, and she got a job doing the accounts receivable for a home improvement company. Are you a CPA? he asked. She shook her head. No, I never went quite that far, but I was hoping to do so someday, she said. He told her about his background and job. We're always on the lookout for a good person. Maybe if you can get me a resume, we can help each other out. I just may do that, Mr. Chandler, she said, taking a bite of her burger. Just then, his phone buzzed. He saw the number was Karen's phone, so he answered. Hello, he said in a neutral tone of voice. Hey baby, Karen said. He could tell she had been drinking. What's up? Oh, just down at the bar getting a burger. What's up with you? Guess what? I got the top seller award, she said, not waiting for his response. I'm happy for you, he said. Yeah, and they want me to stay here in Vegas next week to work with their agents, she said. Of course, he already knew that was a lie. Isn't that terrific? There's talk that I might get moved into management soon. No doubt, on her back, he thought to himself. That's wonderful. What about our anniversary? That's coming up this Wednesday. I know, and I'm sorry about that. Maybe we can celebrate it next weekend. Don't bother. I know your work is important to you, and I sure wouldn't want you missing a big sale. What's that supposed to mean? She asked. Nothing. It's just that you only get to celebrate ten years of marriage once, but I understand how much your job means to you. Don't worry about it. Well, yes, my job is important to me, but I thought you might be happy for me, she said. I'm very happy. Go. Work with your agents. Don't worry about me. I love you, she said. Okay. Me too. Bye. With that, he ended the call and looked at Christy. Well, there it is, he told her. She shook her head. She's actually choosing Greg over your anniversary, Christy said, placing her hand on his. He almost broke down crying. Here was someone he barely met more concerned about him than his own wife. What a witch. I'm sorry. Thanks, he said, trying to smile. He pulled out Jerry's card and called his private number. Jerry, he said when the older man answered. Jason Chandler here. I just heard from Karen, and she tells me she's going to be in Vegas for another week. And I take it you don't believe her? Jerry asked. Not for a minute, Jason said. Well, I was just working on your report, but I can have my guys watch them. And see what they do, he said. We can go from there. I heard the conference wrapped up a couple of hours ago and they're now in full party mode. Most everyone is going home tomorrow. By the way, your wife and her lover spent the night together last night. I've got some video I think you might be interested in. I'll email it to you if you want. It'll all be in my report. That would be great, Jerry. Thanks. He ended the call and looked at Christy. Well, we'll find out tomorrow what's really going on. The two lovebirds spent the night together. My PI is going to email me some video. Are you interested in looking at it with me? Not really, but I feel like I should. He nodded his head in understanding. Well, let's head over to my house then, he said, standing up. After Jason paid for the meal, they left the bar and headed for his house. By the time they got there and settled into his office, the video had arrived in his email. Want something to drink before we watch this? He asked. Sure, Coke if you have it. One Coke coming right up, he said, going into the kitchen. He came back with two cold Cokes and handed one to her. He fired up the video and they watched as Karen and Greg undressed each other and engaged in various forms of sex. 
Both Christy and Jason fought back tears as they watched their spouses screwing each other. Even more devastating was the pillow talk afterward. What do you think our spouses are doing right now? Karen asked. Well, if I know Christy, she's probably watching one of her boring movies, or maybe reading one of her stupid books. Yeah, I know what you mean. I imagine Jason is probably playing with another one of his stupid spreadsheets or looking over the stock reports. Greg chuckled at that. You'd think he was saving the world or something. Christ, his father's company sells tires, for crying out loud. What's so darned important about that? So, have you figured out what you're going to tell dipshit after the awards banquet tomorrow? Greg asked. Yeah, I'll just tell him I've been asked to stay in Vegas for a week to shadow the reps here. He'll believe that. Heck, he'll believe anything I tell them. I could say the moon is made of green cheese, and he'd go along with it. And by the time he figures it out, we'll be on the beach in Hawaii. I can't wait to see you in that new sling bikini you got. Christy went berserk. Hawaii. That pig is taking some witch off to Hawaii. I'll rip his balls off. She looked at Jason. Sorry for calling your wife a witch. Don't be. I would have called her worse. They turned back to the video. So, what about your anniversary? Are you just going to blow it off? Hawaii sounds much more fun to me than a night at a steakhouse. I'll promise to make it up to him. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. Greg looked at her. You're cold, you know that, he asked. She shrugged her shoulders. It's only our tenth anniversary. There'll be more. Who cares about that? I need you and me right now. With that, they started screwing again, prompting Jason to stop the video. I've seen enough. How about you? Christy nodded her head, tears running down her cheeks. More than enough, she said. I'll be making an appointment Monday to see an attorney about a divorce. You want to join me? Would you mind? She asked quietly. Not at all, he told her. Christy broke down, sobbing. Jason held her in his arms and let her cry on his shoulder. He felt like crying as well, but decided to hold it in. He comforted her as much as he could while battling his own emotions. Would you mind if I stayed here with you tonight? No sex. I just want to be held. Of course you can stay. Stay the week if you want. Thanks. I can't believe I gave that jerk all those years. All that time, I fell for his crap. I know exactly what you mean. He led her upstairs to the master bedroom and found an old t-shirt that looked long enough for her to wear to bed. She took it and went into the bathroom to change. He changed into a pair of pajamas as he waited for her to return and climbed into bed. She came out of the bathroom in the long t-shirt and he almost gasped when he saw her. He always thought Karen's legs looked good, but Christie's were the shapeliest he had ever seen. She smiled as she climbed under the covers. What's the matter? Haven't you ever seen a woman's legs before? None that look as good as yours, Jason said. Flattery will get you everywhere. Sir, she teased. He wrapped an arm around her and held her close, taking in her scent. She put an arm over his chest and snuggled close to him. You know you're the only woman besides my wife I've ever been in bed with in over ten years, he asked. And you're the only man I've been with besides my husband, she said. They looked into each other's faces for what seemed like an eternity. Then Christy leaned over and gave Jason a soft, sensual kiss on the lips. He responded, kissing her back with more passion than he knew was possible. He realized what could happen and backed off. He didn't want to do to Karen what she was doing to him. Apparently, Christy felt the same way and put her head on his shoulders, not saying a word. They fell asleep that way and woke up the next morning spooming each other. Good morning, sleepyhead. You don't need to move on my account, she added as he got up to use the bathroom. Good morning, beautiful. I'll be right back. He went into the bathroom. By the time he came out, Christy had helped herself to the kitchen and was making them each a helping of bacon and eggs. Looking at the clock on the wall, he saw it was 8.30 a.m. 
His attention turned back to Christy. He loved watching her cook wearing his old t-shirt and was reminded for a moment of happier times when Karen made breakfast for them every morning. Darn, that smells good, he said. I hope you don't mind me helping myself to your kitchen, she said. Not at all. I can't remember the last time someone made me breakfast. Karen never cooked for you, she asked. At first, she did, but she quit making breakfast a long time ago, said it took up too much time, and she had to make herself presentable for her clients. Which, Christy muttered. I agree, he said. He took in the smell of the bacon as she placed a large plate in front of him. He devoured his food like a man who hadn't eaten in a month. Darn, that was good. You cook like this every morning. Whenever I can, she said. Jason's phone buzzed. Looking at the screen, he saw Jerry's name and number. So he answered. Good morning, Jerry. Working on Sundays now. Jerry laughed. More often than I care to. I just wanted to let you know that your wife and her lover boarded their flight in Las Vegas just before 6 o'clock this morning. They had a 40-minute layover at Lax, and the plane took off from there about an hour ago. They'll be landing in Honolulu in about five hours or so. I have the flight information if you want it. I do, Jason said. They're on American Airlines Flight 31. I have someone in Honolulu ready to pick up their trail when they get there. Thanks, Jerry, Jason said, writing down the information. He ended the call and looked back at Christy. Well, he said, it's on. They're on their way to Hawaii. Karen sat back in her seat after the plane took off. Glancing out the window, she watched as the plane headed out over the Pacific Ocean. This is it, she thought to herself. Looking to her left, she saw Greg was already sound asleep in the seat next to hers. She closed her eyes for a moment and thought about the last ten years. For a moment, she felt a pang of guilt at what she was doing to her husband, who foolishly trusted her. Deep down, she knew that this was just the latest in a series of bad decisions on her part. But she rationalized. She owed this to herself. Eventually, she thought, this will end with Jason none the wiser. Her marriage would go on, and they would ultimately retire and grow old together. Her first bad decision was telling Jason she couldn't get pregnant. The truth was, she could, but she just didn't want to get tied down with babies. The idea of motherhood might appeal to some, but not to her. So, she told Jason that a medical complication forced her to have her tubes tied. He bought her explanation and eventually accepted it. But she had problems with the IUD and was forced to quit using it. The pelvic pain and the headaches finally became too much for her to endure, so she decided to use standard birth control pills instead. She also started using the calendar rhythm method and avoided having sex during her more fertile days. It worked most of the time, but she did end up pregnant twice. The first time was with her husband. Fearful of what his reaction would be to her pregnancy, which would unmask her first lie, in her own desire to remain childless, she discreetly sought an abortion, paying for it with her own money. Thankfully, they had agreed early on to have personal accounts along with a joint account. They had initially agreed to deposit 10% of their net pay, but she fudged a lot. She could pay for the abortion out of her own money, and Jason would remain in the dark. The second pregnancy was with Greg about six months ago. She told her lover about it and made the decision to get another abortion, again paying for it out of her own account. Hopefully, she thought, Jason would never find out about it. And then, there were her affairs. She remained faithful to her husband for the first seven years of their marriage, but that changed one day while she was out with a client, who just happened to be very good-looking and also very rich. It was a spur-of-the-moment decision, but one she never really regretted. They made mad, passionate love in the master bedroom of the large house she was showing, and he showed his appreciation by buying the house on the spot. She didn't do that very often, maybe about ten times over the course of the next year and a half, but she learned later that others had done the same thing. Sure, she felt a bit guilty, but she decided, what the heck, if the other girls can do it and get away with it, 
So could she. In her mind, it didn't affect Jason any. She never stopped loving him. And what he didn't know wouldn't hurt him. Then she met Greg, and things changed. He was everything her husband wasn't. Jason liked to analyze everything before making a decision, whereas Greg was spontaneous and made spur-of-the-moment decisions. Jason's life and career had been decided long ago. He had worked for his father all his life and still did. Soon, he would become the CFO of his father's tire company. And one day, he would take over as president and CEO. Greg, on the other hand, didn't know where he would be in five years and took things one day at a time. While Jason thought about the future, Greg lived for the moment. They were also quite different in bed. While Jason made love to her and focused on her pleasure, Greg simply took her and drilled her. At first, they met at motels and hotels around town, or a house they had listed for sale, but she became concerned that someone might spot them and alert either Jason or Greg's wife, Christy. Then there was the night that Jason expressed concern that they were drifting apart. She got scared and cooled it with Greg for a while. She focused all her love on her husband, but that didn't last too long. Greg wanted to start back up, but she was afraid that Jason might learn about them. She had to come up with an answer, so she decided to buy her own condo. That way, she would have a special place for her and Greg. He wanted to screw her in the bed she shared with her husband, but she shot that down. Even though she considered Jason to be something of a stick in the mud, she still had some feelings for him. It also helped that she and Jason decided long ago to file separate tax returns. She could easily keep the condo from him while getting the tax benefits. It was a win-win all around. Or at least, that's what she told herself. All of that led to this, her latest decision to spend a week in Hawaii with Greg. She took a week's vacation from her office, telling them she was going to Hawaii with her husband after the annual corporate gathering. Greg, meanwhile told his wife he would be on the road for the next week, which wasn't uncommon for him. She lied to Jason, telling him she would be in Vegas for the week. Of course, all it would take is a phone call or two, and he would know better. Fortunately for her, she thought, Jason believed whatever she told him. The only downside was that she would miss spending her 10th anniversary with Jason. She would make it up to him, though, once she got back, and all this would remain her secret. She smiled as she looked down at the blue water below them, thinking about Hawaii. She pulled out her phone and checked for messages or calls. This is where her world collapsed. She saw a message. Your belongings have been moved to your love nest. Don't come home. Your soon-to-be ex-husband, Jason. Next, she saw an email. It had an attachment. She opened the attachment and saw the video of her and Greg. Screwing. There was a message in the email. If you fight the divorce, I will send this video to every soul that knows you. I will ensure that every workplace you visit, this video will be ahead of you. As for the lover boy, once he is back, he is looking at divorce and life on the street. I will ensure that your lover boy is turned into an example of why you do not screw another man's wife. By now, the blood had drained from Karen's body. Holy crap, I am done. What will I do now? If he is that ticked off, he will do what he says. Suddenly, she felt the plane shudder and thought that maybe they had hit turbulence. She felt the plane nose down, and the engine sounded different. She realized something was dreadfully wrong when she looked out the window. Suddenly, there was a flurry of activity in the cabin and she could feel the gee forces start to push her into her seat. Looking outside, she could tell they were going down. Fast. Oh my God, she thought to herself. This is it. We're going to crash. I'm going to die. Oxygen masks suddenly fell down, and she could hear other passengers, including Greg, screaming as the flight attendants tried to prepare them for the inevitable. She looked at her phone, and with tears smearing her face, made one last decision. Jason and Christy had finished breakfast and put the last of the dishes away. They sat back down at the table and discussed plans for dealing with their wayward spouses. Jason was impressed with Christy's ability to analyze a problem. 
Right now, he felt closer to her than he had to Karen for months. He had just returned to the table with a second cup of coffee for them when his phone buzzed. He saw Karen's name and number, so he put it on speaker. Hello, witch, he asked. Jace, he heard Karen cry out. It was hard to hear as there was a lot of background noise, and they heard other people screaming. Yes, Karen, what's going on? he asked. No time, plane going down. So sorry. Forgive me, they heard before the call suddenly ended. Jason and Christy looked at each other, shocked. He tried calling Karen back, but it went straight to voicemail. He looked at Christy. Try calling Greg, he told her. She ran into the front room and grabbed her phone from her purse. As he watched, she tried calling but shook her head. It went straight to voicemail, she said. He went into his home office and fired up his computer. After it came up, he did a search and found a contact number for the airline. He called and got the runaround, but was finally able to talk to someone who confirmed they were investigating reports the plane had gone down. He left his name and number, along with Karen's and Greg's information, and was told someone would contact him. He also left Christie's information so they could contact her. He did a quick Google search, but nothing showed up. He figured it would take at least an hour before any news showed up. They went into the front room and turned on the television, wondering if anything had been reported. Jason went from channel to channel, but nothing was being reported. He looked at his phone and thought about the events leading up to this moment. Finally, one of the news networks reported that an American Airlines flight to Honolulu had crashed in the Pacific, but there were no details. Oh God, Christy said, her hand over her mouth. Jason held her and silently prayed that Karen was still alive. He hated what she did to their marriage, but he didn't want her dead. An hour later, his phone rang. He turned down the television and answered. Mr. Chandler, a woman asked. This is he, he said. I just wanted to reach out and confirm that your wife's flight has crashed, she said. I don't have any more information for you at this time, but we'll contact you just as soon as we have more information. Thank you, Jason said, ending the call. He and Christy shared a hug and shed a few tears. A few minutes later, Christy's phone rang, and she was given the same information. Sometime later, his father called. This was not unusual, as his parents often reached out to him whenever they heard something like this on the news. Hey Jace, his father said. Hey Dad, how's things going? He asked. Just got back from church. Did you see the news about that crash? His father asked. Yeah, I did, Jason said. That's terrible, his father said. By the way, how's Karen? Isn't she on her way back from Vegas? She's not doing too well right now, Dad. She was on that airplane that crashed. What? His father asked, shocked. What was she doing going to Hawaii without you? She was with her boyfriend, Jason said. Oh my God, the elder man said. I'm so sorry to hear that, son. Listen, you take the week off and take care of things. I'll let Mike know. If there's anything we can do, just call, okay? Thanks, Dad, Jason said. He ended the call. His mind flooded with conflicting emotions. On one hand, he was sad that Karen was, in all likelihood, dead. On the other, he was angry with her for cheating. He was also angry at himself for not confronting her. Strangely enough, he wasn't upset about the fact that her death would mean no divorce. Then he had another thought. He would have to deal with all her final expenses, including the condo. Crap, he thought to himself. He looked at Christy and wondered how she would manage all this. What would she do? He had a thought and approached her. Christy, why don't you sell your place and move in here with me? She looked up at him, tears filling her eyes. Do you mean that? She asked. Yes, I do. I have another bedroom upstairs, and you're going to have a lot to deal with over the next few months. Maybe we could help each other get through this. She thought for a minute before answering. Why not? But only on one condition. What's that? 
You let me sleep with you, she said. Seriously, Jason asked. This was moving much faster than he thought it would, and he wondered if it was wise. He set that thought aside and decided to throw caution to the wind. Yes, I haven't really had the comfort of a husband for a long time. Last night, I felt content for the first time in ages. Is that okay with you? It's more than okay, he said. Good. Then I'll run back to the house to get my things and I'll be back over tonight. Jason nodded his head. I'll be here, he said. After she left, he called Lucy, the woman who ran the office Karen normally worked out of. Hello, she said when she answered her cell. Lucy, this is Jason Chandler, he said. Oh, hi Jason. How's Hawaii? I don't know. I hear it's nice this time of year. Why? Well, Karen said the two of you were going there after the company meeting. I assumed you were on your way. No, she was on her way to Hawaii, but not with me. She left with Greg. What? Lucy asked, shocked. That's right, but she didn't make it. Neither did he. The plane they were on crashed into the Pacific Ocean earlier today. Maybe you saw it on the news. Oh no, do you know if she made it okay? I don't think either of them survived the crash, he said. I'm so sorry. Please accept my condolences and thanks for letting me know. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but the company has life insurance for all their employees. I'll get the paperwork started first thing in the morning, but I will need something from the airline. Can you get that to me? Yeah, I'll get what I can. I do have a question for you, though. What's that? Lucy asked. Were you aware that Karen was having an affair with Greg? He asked. I suspected there was something going on. There were rumors, but nothing more. We usually don't gossip about things like that in the office. I see. Well, that's all I have. I'll be in touch. Thanks, and again, please accept my condolences. I appreciate that, Jason said, ending the call. That night, as he and Christy watched television, a report came on about the crash. According to the report, the plane's final moments were captured by a crewman aboard a freightliner that was just a couple of miles from the crash site. The network aired the amateur video, which clearly showed the airplane rapidly falling nose first. It looked like the craft literally pancaked as it hit the water. The report said the freighter changed course to see if they could recover any survivors. They pulled a number of bodies out of the water, but there were no survivors. They also recovered a lot of luggage, including Karen's and Greg's. Neither Karen's nor Greg's bodies were found. The next few months were hectic for both Jason and Christy. She moved in with Jason and sold her house. Jason had plenty to deal with, including Karen's condo. There was nothing in it he wanted, so he gave everything away to Goodwill, which was more than happy to take it. He finally sold the condo, getting back what Karen had originally paid for it. Both he and Christy received an insurance check for $500,000 from Acma Real Estate for the deaths of their respective spouses. Christy moved in with Jason, and they immediately began exercising all traces of Karen. Pictures came down, knickknacks were pulled, and furniture, especially the bed, was replaced. Jason let family members take what they wanted. The rest, including the two cars, was either sold, burned, given to goodwill, or tossed in the dump. Jason also had to jump through hoops to resolve Karen's bank accounts. After a couple of months and a mountain of paperwork, he walked away with a check for around $250,000. Lawyers pounced on both Jason and Christy, looking to capitalize on the crash. Further investigation revealed that the crew misunderstood warnings from the onboard computer and took the wrong actions. The craft fell at an estimated 12,000 feet per minute and hit the water at somewhere around 135 miles per hour, meaning that it took just over three minutes for the plane to smash into the ocean. Karen's last three minutes, some of which were on the phone to him, must have been hell, he thought. Her last act had been one of contrition, 
no doubt brought on by the realization that she was plummeting to her death and there was nothing anyone could do about it. Nevertheless, he thought, it was too little and far too late. Fortunately, the airline settled with all the affected families, paying a little over $175,000 for each passenger. Between Jason and Christy, they grossed a bit more than $1.6 million after everything had been accounted for. Of course, the tax man got his share, but they still ended up with a very tidy nest egg. Since neither Karen's nor Greg's remains were found, there was no need for a funeral, but Jason and Christy held memorial services, mostly for the benefit of their respective families. Neither one shed a tear for their deceased spouses. They did discuss that Jason will not desecrate their symbolic graves, but a few weeks later Jason visited their graves. I just came to tell you that I am very happy that you are dead. The divorce would have cost me money, but since your death, I am getting money. Thanks for dying, which Jason began walking away, but then turned back and desecrated their graves. I will regret not confronting you and watching your face turn white, but desecrating your grave is a much better feeling. With that, Jason felt a sense of relief. Now that feels better. Three months after the services, Christy left her job and went to work for Jason. By now, they were madly in love with each other. One night, as they ate dinner at the local Texas Roadhouse, Jason got on one knee and proposed. Christy squealed with delight as patrons around them applauded. It's about time you decided to make an honest woman out of me, she whispered in his ear. Why's that? he asked. Because you're going to be a daddy, she said. He covered her face with kisses. I love you so much, he told her. I love you more, just one favor though. What's that? he asked. Please don't ask me to fly anywhere, she said. He laughed as he hugged her close. No worries, my dear. If you ever fly, I'll be your wings. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.